God's house today. Today uh, in our service, we are continuing this series that we've been going through for, for a while now called Hard Truths. As we see some of the difficult things that, that God tells us in Scripture, there, there is a temptation at times to push back against those things. And yet, because they come from the mouth of God, we remember that they are to be received in faith, believed in our hearts, and then also, to whatever extent God calls for it, to be put into effect in our lives. So we're going to be looking at another one of those today from Ecclesiastes. Um, if you uh, have a moment during the service, or even maybe right now, to fill out one of those green connection cards, um, you can put that into the offering plate as that comes around later on, or hand one to an usher on your way out. That simply helps us to kind of um, serve you better as a congregation, knowing um, who's been here and when they've been here. So um, even if you're here every Sunday, it's great if you can fill one of those out and put that into the plate. Other than that, go ahead and take a moment to greet one another before we begin. We'll start things this morning with our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions, I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us 
and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. God, you have told us not to be anxious about what we need for this life. Move our hearts to seek you and your kingdom, that all good things may be given to us as well. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today from 1 Timothy 6 reminds us to view our money and our wealth properly, not to put our hope into something that is here one day and gone tomorrow, but to put our hope into the living God. This reframes, reframes our attitudes on, on our material wealth and also reminds us to put our true God in that rightful place of Lord over our lives. We read, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is God's word. I invite the children at this time forward for the children's message.
good morning, and good to see you. Now, if you were here last week, you maybe saw Pastor Brown take out a wallet and put it in front of him. Right? I'm, I'm not stealing his, his children's message today, I promise. Uh, I do have a wallet here. What do you usually find in a wallet? Okay, maybe some credit cards. Boy, it's 2022. Debit cards? Okay, money, right? So, yeah, something we call it our plastic, right? That's, that's a way that we can use money, but sometimes you just have paper money like this, right? And some people might have more of this in their wallets. Some people might have less of it in their wallets. You know, it's kind of weird, though. Funny thing. Some people are either happy or unhappy, depending on how much of this they have in their wallets. When they don't have much, they can feel pretty unhappy. When they have more in there, they might feel happy, but then guess what? You spend it and it goes away and, and people feel unhappy again, right? Are there things, though, in your life that sometimes you feel unhappy if you don't have it? Yeah, maybe. Maybe if, you, uh, maybe if your parents, you get in trouble and your parents cut out TV as a consequence for something you did, right? You don't have something and, and you might feel like that makes you unhappy. You need that back to make you happy. Maybe sometimes you do feel like, man, my, I just got this $2 in my allowance and my parents are making me put some of that in the offering plate. That makes me unhappy. I don't want to lose my money, right? Maybe it's a, a toy, something that one of your friends has perhaps that may, you think, man, I, I need that too and I'm not going to really be that happy until I do. I'm going to bug my parents for it. And then you get it maybe even at Christmas or for your birthday and you enjoy it for four weeks and then you're not happy again. You need something else. A lot of times we think that we need things, we need stuff to be happy. But that's really not true, is it? Because then we just need more stuff to be happy. We need more stuff after that to be happy. We're going down the wrong path, thinking that certain things are going to make us happy. Who do we need to be truly happy in life? To be truly filled and content. Who do we need? We need Jesus, don't we? we? We need God. We need God in our lives. Of course, because of sin, well, sin is something that separates us from God because he's holy and we're not. But does that mean that we can't have God in our lives? It doesn't, does it? Now, somebody already said Jesus, and that's where we find the answer, right? God sent his one and only son to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that God doesn't see us as sinners anymore. Right now, God sees us as his holy children. He sees us as people who don't have sin on their records anymore. And so we do have God's presence in our lives. In fact, not just during our lives here, we have God's presence in our lives forever because he says that one day he's going to take us to heaven to be with him. So don't think that you need this to make you happy. You don't. You already have God. He's the one that we need. And when we seek him with our hearts, we find true happiness. Let's hold our hands and say a prayer. Let's hold our hands. Hold our hands. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to suffer and die on the cross to pay for our sins. Now we know that your presence is in our lives. We thank you that not only do we have you here in this life, but that we will be with you forever in heaven. Amen. Thanks for coming on up. You can head back to your seats now. And we'll continue with our verse of the day. And all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33.
gospel lesson today, it might at first glance seem as though Jesus is promoting dishonesty amongst his disciples. That's not his point in, in, in this parable, though. His point is that people use worldly wealth in order to gain something worldly for themselves. And they, and they usually use wisdom in accomplishing that goal, at least in that earthly sense. However, since we have true spiritual riches, Jesus brings this before his disciples and says, now how will you view and use the worldly riches that you have in order to accomplish godly spiritual goals? In this way, we show that our lives are not dominated by the idol of money and material wealth, but that the true God is Lord over our lives. Please stand out of respect for the words and works of our Savior from Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
I found, in my experience, that there are two areas of life where people really don't appreciate unsolicited advice. One of them is regarding parenting. Like, nobody likes being told by a stranger or even by a well-meaning friend how to raise their kids, right? The other area, though, is money. How I use the dollars and cents in my wallet and my bank account is really nobody's business but my own, right? Well, don't worry, I'm not going to stand up here in front of you today and give you the, the long laundry list of do's and do nots with your money. I'm going to let your uh, small group leaders take care of that this week. But even if you're not in a small group, uh, I, I would advise that you um, get your hands on some of those Bible study questions so that you can look at some of these passages in which God tells us how to use the, the earthly blessings that he's given us. Because the reality is, whether we like it or not, there are a lot of passages in the Bible. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of Bible passages in which God tells us how to use our worldly wealth in wise and godly ways. Today, though, we're going to look at something a little more fundamental, right? Kind of a more foundational element to all of this. We're going to look at the attitudes, the attitudes that, that we harbor, as well as the, the attitudes that view worldly wealth in a godly way, right? Because really, it's our attitudes the way that we view, the way that we feel about something, which then determine the decisions and the choices that we make concerning it. And so we're going to be looking at this attitude toward money through the lens of Scripture as we find it in Ecclesiastes 5 today. Even before we do, though, it's probably worth taking a step aside and asking, how does our culture view money and wealth as well as, when we talk about money and wealth, we also want to include today the idea of the things that money can buy, both the tangible and the intangible. That is to say that oftentimes you can gain something that you can't purchase with money, things like power and, and influence, right? Now, the way that our culture views this is that if you have money, that's what makes you important. If you have money then you really have it made, right? And so we are taught, even from very early on, to idolize almost and seek to become the actors, the actresses that maybe you saw a week or two ago at the Emmys, to idolize and emulate as best we can the business tycoons and professional athletes and politicians, right? <clears throat> That's really what life is all about, isn't it? Maybe you've heard that saying, more money, more problems before. You've probably even used it yourself. Do you know who says that? People who don't have money and want to feel better about themselves. Really, the attitude so often deep down inside of us is this. More money? Yes, please, right? And that's why it's important to note that the man who wrote Ecclesiastes 5, that wrote all of Ecclesiastes, is somebody who had money. In fact, if you pooled all the resources of everybody in this room right now, his wealth would have blown us out of the water, okay? And he also had all of those things that come along with money. He had the palaces. He had the great accomplishments and achievements. He had power. He had influence, probably more so than anybody else in that area of the world at that time. His name was Solomon. He was the son of King David. Now, by the time that he writes Ecclesiastes, he is probably a fairly old man, or at least um, older than he used to be, right? And so now he's looking back upon his life, and he's kind of answering some questions to himself. Like, what did all of the money and palaces really give me, right? Everything that I worked so hard to achieve, what did this ultimately do for me in the end? And here in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 to 20, we find part of his answer to those questions. Now, we're going to start here with just a few of those verses, verses 10 to 12, where Solomon says, whoever loves money 
never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. What does it gain, right? There is this mindset that we have that, that money is what brings us power, that, that money is what brings us what we so need in life. And yet, Solomon, who had so much of this, what does he say about it? He says it's meaningless, right? Our, our first hard truth today then is this. If money is what you love, your heart will always feel empty. You see, all of us are born with a, a need inside of us, a, a desire, a hunger that, that needs to be filled. And it's not physical, it, it's spiritual in nature, right? It's a desire and a need to be with God, to have his presence in our lives. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, they had this need met. They didn't have this hunger because that desire was supplied for them constantly. They lived with God. They walked with God. They dwelt in his presence until the day, of course, that they fell. They were deceived into believing that they needed something more to be satisfied, something more to be content. And so they disobeyed God. As a result, they were kicked out of the garden. And God's holy presence was removed from them. All of their offspring now, you and me, we are born with what, and maybe you've heard it called this sometimes, born with a God-sized or a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And so if we're trying to fill that up with stuff, with, with physical things or with worldly things, it's just never going to be enough, right? That, that emptiness is going to continue. Solomon sure tried in his life. My goodness, he expounds at length in Ecclesiastes over how he tried to fill himself up with all of this stuff. And in the end, what does he say? He calls it meaningless. It's a word that he uses again and again. Now, if you were looking, if you were reading Ecclesiastes 5 in the original Hebrew, what you would find there is the word havel, which literally translated means vapor or mist. Solomon uses that word again and again and again in order to describe what all he had and what all he accomplished really did for him in the end. If you're trying to fill yourself up with money, with the things that money can buy, with the things that money can gain, with all of the pursuits and obsessions that you have with getting more money, Understand that Solomon says, it is like trying to feed a starving person fog. And even as you consume more of it, your appetite and your hunger will only in continue to increase. And it will never, ever, ever be enough. Solomon goes on. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for? the wind. All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Your other accompanying hard truth today is this. If money is what you love, you will live in turmoil. With fear and anxiety and worry and frustration in your heart. Right? The darkness that Solomon speaks of in those verses is a darkness of the heart and of the mind. 
because you believe that life is found in accumulating more stuff and there is always more stuff to be accumulated. The three years prior to my coming here, I was teaching English 12. There was a, a, a short, uh, what? can't think of the word right now. There was a short story. There's, I kind of call it a short novel. A short story. There's a short story that we would read each year called The Rocking Horse Winner. Maybe some of you have read this before by D.H. Lawrence. Um, it tells the story, though, of a, a middle-class family in England. And they're, they're fairly well-to-do. They have a, a nice home. They've got a family. The kids have toys. They've got good schools, and they've got tutors, and they even have, have servants to help them kind of keep track of everything. And yet, the mindset of the parents is that of always needing more. They're never satisfied. They're never content. In fact, it starts to become this almost like ghostly echo around the halls that the kids hear, the whisper, there must be more money. There must be more money. There must be more money. And so even when they start to accumulate money through some kind of bizarre means, it's still not enough. Then they need more money to take care of the things that they have just bought. They need more, they need more. And it wreaks absolute havoc on one of their children. This is that, that darkness, though, that turmoil that Solomon is talking about that comes with that obsession over money and wealth and what we think it's going to get for us. So I'm going to get very direct with you at this point. Let's understand, yes, we all come from, from different backgrounds. We all have different financial situations. And yet, there are some attitudes which, no matter how, if you have a ton or a little, there are some attitudes about money that have a way of pervading every financial class of people. So I'm sorry if I start to sound a little bit like a Jeff Foxworthy routine here, but... Here goes. <clears throat> if work and business mean that you are hardly ever coming to God's house for worship or gathering around other members, gathering with other members around God's word, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you find that you can't give generously and often both to the ministry of the church and also to the poor and needy around you, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you find that you're losing sleep because you're stressed about your finances, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you think that you need more money before you can finally be content and satisfied, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you're willing to deceive others in business or to cut corners on your taxes, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you find that you can't open the purse strings even a little bit to enjoy some of the, the simple pleasures and blessings of life because you're so worried about the bottom line in your bank account, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you believe that money makes you important and that more money will make you more important, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. If you hear of a friend or a fellow member in the congregation that is in need and yet you figure that you can't do anything to help them, you might have an unhealthy relationship with money. Now by this point, I have probably at least put you, all of you, into one of these categories or another. And I will be completely honest with you, the reason why I was able to come up with such a list is because I know that I fall into so many of these categories too. But if you think that, that you're standing firm in this area, that, that money attitudes, that, that ungodly attitudes about material wealth are not something that you really struggle with, I'm going to share with you that I used to think that way too. I used to think that I didn't really struggle in this area. I was willing to give generously to the church, I was w willing to share with people in need. I was willing even just to, to spend money on friends sometimes so that, so that they can enjoy something. I didn't stay up at night worrying about money and finances and numbers. And then my wife and I moved to Colorado, where the cost of living was approximately double what it had been in Nebraska. When money had been in plenty, there was no worry. 
When money started to get a little tight, well, that's when those sleepless nights started to come. The attitude was really there, lurking underneath the whole time. It simply took a change in circumstances to bring that out of me. Another way of saying it, I started to finally show symptoms of the problem. And so again, if you think that you're standing firm in this area, be careful and continue to, to keep your heart guarded because sometimes all it takes is a dramatic change of circumstances, isn't it? I, I do think we have to ask the question, why though? Why so much fear? Why so much anxiety over this? Well, part of it has to do with the fact that, that we do, we, we are deceived into thinking that we are going to gain satisfaction and comfort. And I think the reason we think that is because we do get a little bit, don't we? It doesn't last, though, does it? And so we think we need more, like that family in the short story that I mentioned. And yet, there is still this undercurrent always in our lives. There is this knowledge of what is coming, and Solomon brought that up in our verses, that sooner or later, you are going to be separated from everything that you have in this life. Whether you have much or little, death is coming. And when it does, you will no longer have those things that you took, even those small comforts and satisfactions in. Well, thanks for the real uplifting message here, Pastor Dan. Um, you've given us a lot to be happy about today. We need to go on, okay, because as we get into these last verses, this is where Solomon now provides the solution to the whole matter. Solomon says, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. Now Solomon is saying here that when we toil, in order to achieve satisfaction and gladness for ourselves, it doesn't work. The toil, though, now in these verses is different. This is one who is toiling with happiness right there alongside them as they work. This is one who is working with satisfaction hand in hand accompanying them. How does a person come to this point? How does a person arrive here where Solomon finally, it seems, has? He finishes by saying, they seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. And understand, this is not just that God is sending them things to keep them busy and happy. No, it's God himself who is filling them up, who is occupying them. We use that word all the time in that way, right? You might run into a friend and, and, and say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. What have you been doing with your life? And they say, oh, I'm just, I'm so occupied by work lately, right? What do they mean? They don't mean that work is giving them like a bunch of random things that are filling their time. They're saying that their life is filled up and is revolving around work, right? And that's the way that we're using that word here. That's the way that Solomon is using this. He is speaking of the one whose life and whose heart is filled up and occupied with God. The life which doesn't just have God in part or in parcel one hour a week on Sunday mornings, but the one whose entire existence revolves around the Lord. In this, he says then, that there is satisfaction and there is gladness of heart. And why is that? The answer is kind of obvious. It's because only God is big enough to fill up that God-sized hole in our hearts. And so there won't be satisfaction. There won't be true joy in life until he is right where he belongs. But doesn't this bring us to one final problem? Didn't we mention earlier in the service about how when Adam and Eve sinned, when they disobeyed, that presence was withdrawn and taken away from them? Well, yes, that certainly is true. 
But God is also the one who provides the solution to that problem. That presence was removed with Adam and Eve's disobedience, but now through the obedience of the one and only Son, Jesus, it is restored to us again. Whereas we have a mile-long list of disobedience and unrighteousness in our lives, when, when Jesus came, he was filled with his Father in every way. In what he said, what he did, even all the way down to the attitudes of his heart, his life revolved entirely around his Father in heaven. And then, he made himself that substitutionary sacrifice, taking our sins, our unrighteousness upon himself so that he could hand over to us his holiness. Yes, holy God cannot dwell in the presence of sinful people, and he doesn't. Through Jesus, holy God dwells in the presence of his holy people. And with that holiness, there now comes an end to that long separation between you and God as he gathers you again into his arms and into his own family. That hostility is ended in the peace treaty that is signed by the blood of Jesus. And now with that reconciliation come all of those other things that we think we are going to achieve through money and through having more stuff and through everything else that we think it'll buy us. In that reconciliation, we find true purpose in life. In that reconciliation, we find worth that no amount of money can change whatsoever. We find true significance and everlasting protection and security. We find things, in fact, which not even death can separate from us because not even death can separate us from our God and from his love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. In fact, now even death only brings you closer and nearer into that presence. So here's our, our beautiful truth today. When God is what you love, you will have gladness of heart no matter how much money you have. It took Solomon a while to figure this out, but it does seem that eventually by the end of his life, he finally got it. May God grant that it not take us so long. May God grant that we have hearts and attitudes about money that are transformed by his grace, by our relationship with him, and by his everlasting presence in our lives. Amen. We'll continue now confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll now continue with our thank offerings. Again, if you have those connection cards filled out, please deposit those into the plates as they come around.
In our prayers today, we will remember, first of all, the, the family of Larry Wendt, who passed away four years ago this month. We will also remember and ask God for a quick healing for Ann Potter, who's been hit with kind of a nasty little bout of COVID here. We ask that she would be able to return to her ministry over at Our Shepherd quickly. Dear Lord, thank you for the many blessings you've poured out upon us. In such a wealthy country as you've put us in, it becomes very easy for us to seek satisfaction and fulfillment from money and from what we think money can give us. Forgive us, Lord, for idolizing such things, and teach us to run only after you for our soul's satisfaction. We also ask, good and gracious God, that you continue to bring comfort and kindness to the family of Larry Wendt. The passing of years does not bring with it always a passing of pain for our lost loved ones. And we pray that you would continue to draw his family closer to you, healing them with the promise of the resurrection of all the dead on that day when your son Jesus comes again in glory. Lord, we ask that you also be with Ann Potter as she battles, this, as she battles sickness. Please restore her to full health in your time and according to your gracious will, so that she can again resume work for your kingdom among the children and staff at Our Shepherd. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and we join together in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Continue by singing the Thank the Lord.
of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace today, live in love and in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord your God in gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. our service with a closing hymn.